There, um, there's a, in the 1920s, there's a man by the name of Charles Rosenfield. And the name will mean nothing to you. Does anybody actually know who Charles Rosenfield is? That would be like impressive. Some guy is just a real history buff. Charles Rosenfield worked for a, a company called the Mather Company out of Chicago. <clears throat> it was a printing company. And he is the person that is credited with inventing what we call the motivational poster. You know, like maybe you grew up in the corporate world and you have, you know, this vision, you know, what it is and what it isn't. You know, those, those motivational things that are, a lot of times they're kind of cheesy, but they're true and effective. Well, he started putting some of these up in their company. <clears throat> and then over time, they grew in popularity so much that by, the, by 1923 to 1929, they made over $4 million dollars in sales from selling these motivational posters to corporations all over America. And you started to see them go up all over the place. And for a company to make $4 million on posters alone in that time span during that part of history was a pretty significant investment. Right? The motivational poster. In 1998, a guy named E.L. Kirsten founded a company named Despair. And he is the one that is accredited in what we create, what we call today the demotivational poster. Right? It was an internet sensation that kind of kicked off towards the end, right as the millennium was flipping in the internet age. You know, this is before the iPod was even a thing. You started to see these demotivational posters creep up. And they were kind of like a motivational poster, but they were ironic. And one of my favorite examples, I actually brought one here for you to, to take a look, uh, it is this <clears throat> motivation. Every dead body on Mount Everest was once a highly motivated person. So maybe calm down a little bit. <laughs> good, uh, good preaching, Pastor. Demotivate us, will you? <laughs> I really, I don't know why, I just really enjoy that one. Our culture has mastered the art of joking about life's hardship and misery a little bit, hasn't it? We like, to, we like to talk about the struggles of this world and, and the things like that ironically, and we've mastered it. And part of why we do this is to cope with the reality that frequently life can be pretty miserable. Right? I'm not saying that life is always terrible. I hope that you don't think that. Maybe you do. But we, we all at some point struggle through terrible things. Right? I met a guy once on a mission trip to St. Louis, and he had this bumper sticker on his car that says, Life sucks, then you die. I thought, wow, that's a pessimistic way of looking at life. And the more I talked to the guy, I'm like, no, that, that sticker was the man's life mantra. I'm like, well, what about this, you know, family? All my family moved away. Well, like, you know, like, do you have hobbies? Eh, I tried stuff. I'm not good at anything. Like, no matter what, you know, it's just this hyper-pessimistic person, right? That's pretty bleak. But if we're honest, at one point or another, we've probably all felt like that. There are many people who have this really negative view of life. And at one point or another, we've all been kind of in that realm of things, right? And, and Ecclesiastes is the book of the Bible that kind of has that view on the surface of it all, right? When you look at Ecclesiastes, in some ways, it's kind of like the Debbie Downer. Anybody remember that character from, S from Saturday Night Live? Right, Debbie Downer, like wah, wah, wah. Right? Ecclesiastes, in many ways, seems on the surface like it's the Debbie Downer of the Bible. Right? Because everything is terrible. Everything is terrible. But that's not really what the book is about. Right? Ecclesiastes, more than any book of scripture perhaps, seeks to answer one of the most basic questions, and that is, what is meaningful in this life? What matters to us? Where indeed can we find purpose and motivation as we go about our daily lives? What are we here for? Do we really just live miserable, sucky lives and then die? Or is there something else to be had? Right. And so over the next five weeks, we're going to unpack and work our way through the whole of the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to have to do it at somewhat of a surface level because otherwise we'd be here for probably a year but we're going to look at this wisdom book and what it's all about. And because it's a pretty difficult book at times to process, um, we have some, something new happening. We have a study that's going to accompany the next five weeks of, of preaching. And so uh, normally on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., there's a class that meets that's led by Mark Wiley. That class is going to take a five-week break starting next week. And instead, we're going to have a five-week sermon discussion time that is led by our very own Carlton Sears. That'll meet at 9 a.m. So next week, if you come, you'll talk about this 
sermon, the, the passages that are talked about in this sermon, and then the week after. Does that make sense? Because it happens before church. So you'll have a whole week to process. And if you want to be a part of that study, I would really encourage you to join. Um, as you walk out the doors, right before you go to the exit doors, there's a little table that has study guides for you. Uh, there's a church in Vancouver, Washington, called Summit Church, that put together this wonderful discussion guide uh, that just perfectly pairs a sermon series. I don't think that's what they did with it, but it just beautifully follows along. And it's five weeks long, and the sermons are five weeks long. It's just it's perfect. It's such a beautiful thing. So I would encourage you to grab one of those guides on your way out the door this morning. And if you're online and you need that, we'll send an electronic copy out in the FYI tomorrow that you can see it as well. And then next week at 9 o'clock, we would invite you to join in Classroom B right down the hall through this wall. Don't run through the wall, but you know how to get there. right? So we, we have this time to be able to get together and just study. And, stuff. and it's not a Bible study so much as it's a discussion time to look at what, what do we hear in the sermon and how can we apply it and what do we do with it and what does that mean for my life and those, those kinds of questions. So if you want to dive in a little deeper in that way, we would encourage you to be a part of that. But for today, let's dig our way into the book of Ecclesiastes and we'll start by reading the first couple verses of it together as we stand and read from God's word. This is the word of the Lord. Ah, you didn't fall for it. Nice. Comes at the end. This is the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse, or verses 1 through 11. The word of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea isn't full. To the place where the streams flow, they flow again. All things are full of weariness, and man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the later things yet to be among those who come after. It's the word of the Lord. Take a seat. Right off the bat... We're introduced to two characters in the book of Ecclesiastes. You might have not caught it, but there's two characters. The first character is uh, the, this, this teacher-preacher. Right? The Hebrew word is kohelet. And kohelet literally means one who gathers people. Right? In this case, it's one who gathers the people to learn. And so the, the, the word used is preacher or teacher. I tend to prefer teacher because I'm not so sure. Like We can debate whether this is technically a sermon or not, and so I think of, I like to use the word teacher. So every once in a blue moon, I'll disagree with the ESV's translation. But it's the, the preacher. But the, the the teacher is not the author of the book. The author of the book of Ecclesiastes is anonymous, and you can see this from the very first set of verses. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Right, the person that's writing that sentence is not themselves the teacher. He's saying, look, these are the words of this teacher. The author is an anonymous person who simply just thinks whatever this teacher is saying is important and we ought to listen to it. It's kind of like a, hey, did you see that movie? And then you proceed to recite the whole movie to your friend right? because you thought it was a great movie. You're not the movie, but you're kind of portraying it. And so we see the, the words of the author for a very short amount of time. It's this one little verse in the beginning, right? or two little verses in the beginning, and then a lot of the last chapter of Ecclesiastes is the author summarizing the rest of the book, what he just portrayed to you, and kind of giving his take and thoughts on it as he goes. Right? And so that's the first. The teacher, we have debates over who it is. The most likely candidate for who is meant by the teacher is King Solomon. And we base that off of the introduction in some ways, right? The preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So whoever this is has to be a descendant of David and has to be someone who was king of Jerusalem. Solomon is the most likely candidate because in Scripture, Solomon is the one who is ascribed as having the most wealth, the most wisdom, the most of everything, right? He's kind of the one who had it all. So when in Ecclesiastes, the preacher, teacher, starts to talk about all the things that he had, all the places he looked for meaning, 
right? Solomon would have had more power, more wealth, more places and options of things to try to find meaning in than any other king who has ever lived, right? And so the assumption is that it's Solomon who is the preacher and teacher, but we don't know that 100% for sure, right? And so right off the bat, we get the, the theme of the book, and the singular word that kind of summarizes all of Ecclesiastes is this word, here it's translated vanity, most English Bibles translate it as meaningless, right? And so we start really, really sad and depressed right off the bat. I said, hey, here's a great book of the Bible. Everything is meaningless. Nothing matters, right? Eeyore. Ugh. Right? But there's a challenge that we have with, with this word meaningless. I, I, I really think that it's a bad translation. Um, the Hebrew word here is this word hevel. And I want us to learn the word hevel because I think there are some words in Greek and Hebrew that really don't have like the best of translation into English. Right? There's like a whole bunch of things that accompany it. We have some German words in the language today that we use the German word because we don't have one English word for it, like schadenfreude. Right? Like, there's some Hebrew words that just don't translate perfectly to one other word. And so hevel is something that we should probably remember. The word hevel really kind of signifies two things in Scripture. The first is this. It is, it is this idea of a vapor or a smoke. Right? So he, in Hebrew... Hevel signifies vapor or smoke. And the second thing is that Hevel signifies the idea of what we maybe would call like an enigma, a mystery to some degree, right? And so smoke, vapor, mysterious, enigma, right? And so in the context of Ecclesiastes, we have to understand that when the author is writing, when the preacher is teaching, he's not saying everything is completely meaningless, nothing has purpose, don't bother, we live, life sucks, and then we die, right? Although he's kind of saying that a little bit. But what he's really trying to get at is, look, life is, number one, kind of a vapor. Whatever you, whenever you try to grab onto it, whenever you try to get a hold of it or pinpoint it somehow, it just, you, just, you can't. You can't really get a grasp for, for what the meaning of life is, what, what, what the point is. You know, you have these various facets of your life. Maybe it's, you know, your career and your purposes. But, like, it's just, it's fleeting, Right? Any area of your life that you kind of grab on and try to make the main thing, it, it just doesn't, you, you grab, you're grabbing straws. It doesn't do anything. And the second idea is that life in every way is an enigma, a mystery. It, it's, it's not something that we can really fully make sense out of. Right? That's why in Scripture a lot of times... There's, there's things about our life that, that God says that are very paradoxical to the way that we would think, right? Whoever wants to be first should be last. Those types of things that you go, what? No, like, to be first, you've got to be first, right? Like, that doesn't work at the Olympics, like, come running really slow in the back and, like, gold medal, right? That doesn't work that way. But in, in the kingdom, there, there's a mystery to life. There's a mystery to the way it works that we just can't quite get our hands around. Like, no one here is really just has a firm grasp on their life. In a, in, a, in a perfect, full way, right? There's a part of it that's just mysterious, right? That's why there's things in the world that don't work the way they should. We have, for instance, we don't have a perfect justice. We feel like there should be, like, you know, if you're good, then good things happen. If you're bad, then bad things happen. But that's not how it works, right? Good people have travesty hit them all the time. And we have people in our life that we think of as bad, that somehow they get ahead, and you just go, why them, right? Life doesn't work the way in the orderly fashion in which we want to box it. It's mysterious. It's, it's unfathomable. It can't be grasped. You can't put your finger on it. Hevel. You should add that to your vocabulary. When you're going through the week and stuff just doesn't make sense and everything's going down the tubes by Monday afternoon, you can just sit in your office and go, Hevel. Because ah. that's what the author is saying. He's like, Hevel, Hevel, everything's Hevel. Every time I think something makes sense in life, Hevel. Every time I think I've got it, I've grabbed onto something, Hevel. Life is in every way an enigma, says the author of Ecclesiastes. Right? So let's explore this a little further. Right? The author, after he lays this out, starts to move into a couple different areas in which life is, in his word, hevel. Right? He doesn't just say, life is hevel, just go about your day, don't bother with anything, you know, you live, you die, life sucks. 
But he goes into the specifics of how life is hevel. And in this first couple chapters, here's some of the specifics that he mentions, and we'll unpack each one of them. He says, self-indulgence is hevel. Wisdom, we all think wisdom's good. Wisdom itself is hevel. Our work, our careers, our toil, our efforts, all of those are hevel. Even time itself is hevel. All of it's hevel. And so let's look at some of these. The first is this, self-indulgence. In chapter 2, um, he begins by listing all of the various pleasures that he sought. Right? He says, listen, self-indulgence is entirely hevel. I'm Solomon, we presume. I would know. And he says, you know, I've, I've sought all the gold that I can. I've had all the servants bring me all the things I've ever wanted. I've had them waving palm trees while I eat grapes in, in beautiful bliss. I've had everything I could ever desire on this earth. Nothing that I could concoct in my head was withheld from me. Imagine that kind of life. You, know, you think a guy like Jeff Bezos, like anything he wants, he just snaps his fingers and it's somehow brought to him. Right? His yacht didn't fit through a bridge in Europe and so he, like, a bridge was moved so his yacht could go through and then rebuilt. Right? Like, you can get anything he wants. That's Solomon. Anything he could ever seek is hevel. And then, once he lists all those things, he says this in verse 9. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I didn't keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. And then I considered all that my hands had done. And the toil that I had experienced, expended in doing it. And behold, all of it was hevel. A striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. After he gets everything, everything, it's all hevel. He goes, I, I still was wanting. I didn't feel fulfilled. It's a lesson to us who seek the stuff to make us happy. If only I could have this or this house or this, this job or my family could be this way or my wife or husband could just act a little more like this. If I could have those things then I would be content. Solomon would tell you, listen, I could have everything I ever wanted. If there's someone in my life who didn't behave the way I wanted them to, they're out and someone else comes in. I indulged in all of it. And at the end, I was still left hevel. And so that can't be where we find meaning. Well, maybe it's wisdom itself. Wisdom is a good thing. God tells us that we should pursue wisdom. So maybe wisdom itself can somehow have meaning. And so this is what he says about wisdom. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. And then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity for the for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies, just like the fool. Right. So wisdom in itself, what's the point? I could be as wise as I can. I'm still going to die someday, and the fool's going to die next to me. Death it shows up in Ecclesiastes all the time, and, and he uses it as this great equalizer. He's like, look, the rich dies, the poor dies. The wise dies, the non-wise dies. The person who has the job he wants dies. The person who doesn't dies. The person who gets the family he wants dies. The person who's single their whole life dies. Whoever we are, like, it's this equalizing thing. And so even wisdom itself isn't, isn't really anything but hevel because in the end, the wise and the simple suffer the same fate. Right? Every one of you in this room is going to die. Super happy sermon time with Vince. Right? But it's true. You could be the wisest person in this church. You're going to die. And you could be the most simpleton person in this church. You're still going to die right next to them. Probably not right next to them, but you get the idea. Right? It doesn't matter. And so then he goes to the thing that we probably most struggle with as a society. He goes to work. And he talks about how work and toil itself is hevel. Let's look. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun. Seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether that whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. 
This is also Hevel. So I turned about and gave my heart to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who didn't work or did not toil for it. This also is Hevel and a great evil. Saying, look, work has no real meaning because whatever work I produce, whatever the fruits of my labors are, I can't take it with me. So, right, maybe you have a kid who you're like, God, I can't believe everything's going to be left to you. It won't, it won't make it two generations, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's not you. Maybe you're excited to leave the things to your kids. But regardless, you, you don't know what will happen as the generations unfold. You don't know whether the next generation after you will squander things. And we can talk about this both in a family sense with our children or in the sense of a country or the whole world, right? There's probably decisions we're making now that the founding fathers would roll over in their graves, remembering what they died to secure for us. And they would look at us now and go, what? Well, if I knew you were going to squander it, I probably wouldn't have laid down my life for that, right? I don't hear, and this isn't a political thing. I'm not, I'm just, you know, this is an example. Like we, 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 all the time as a culture, right? You, if you're an older person, you might look at the younger generation and you go, well, all the stuff that my generation built, you're just tearing it down. What was the point? Why did I put all that effort, right? And Ecclesiastes, the author, the teacher would say, yeah, right on. Right? Maybe, we'll get to that. But the toil itself is hevel to him because everything eventually will fade. And our legacies also will fade. I have bad news for you if you have an ego. Chances are not a single one of us in this room is going to be in a history book in 100 years. I remember when they were doing the, the pastor search committee and they put, you know, they, they put the search, the information for candidates uh, on the website, and one of the things they had was the history of the church. And at the very bottom, there was just a small paragraph that listed all the former pastors of the church. And I realized that I, 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 knew, I was friends with one of them, and I knew another one. But I had no idea who the other guys even were. I don't know what they look like. I've never heard a sermon of theirs. I don't know what, what or if any contributions specifically they made to this church. I'm sure I could talk to some of you and find those things out. But that's only because some of you in this room were still alive when they were pastors here. And I thought about, there's going to be a time 50, 60, 70 years from now where some young guy is going to stand up here as your pastor and he's, all, all I'm going to be to them is just the name on the bottom of a website. So even your pastor isn't going to have a lasting legacy in the, in, in the history books, right? 99% of us will be forgotten within two generations. It's the reality. Our toil is heaven. There'll be a line on the bottom of the site that says Vince Latz, pastor, 2021 till question mark, right? That's it. And so we can see, if we look here, this teacher's goal is to start to look at the things that we hold most dear, right? Some would say, like John Calvin, the things that we idolize, the things that we in life feel like we need to invest all of our time and effort into, Jobs, our careers, our legacies, our savings accounts, our future, our families, the wisdom, the knowledge that we can get, right? We need to read as much as we can. The more we understand, the better. And he's trying to say, listen, all these things aren't ultimately going to get you there. They're all hevel. Right? No matter how hard you pursue them, they aren't going to be the thing that brings you ultimately satisfaction in life. So then what is? What is the thing that's going to do that? And to get that answer, we have to get all the way through the book of Ecclesiastes. Right? But we do get today a small little hint, a sneak preview. And that hint is right in the smack middle of chapter 3. It goes like this. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all this toil. This is God's gift to man. 
I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor nothing taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him, to which is already, to which is already has been, that which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. God and his work, what God does, somehow has something to do with the meaning of life. That's number one. Later, he's going to argue that even the fear of the Lord is hevel. And we'll get to that in a couple weeks. It gets really dark there for a second. But he's saying that, listen, whatever the meaning is, wherever we do find it, wherever we do find this purpose, the thing that isn't hevel, somehow God has something to do with it. Right? And, and two, where our work, toil, and production is fleeting, the things that we can produce are fleeting and forgotten in generations, the things that God does are enduring. Right? They don't go away. They don't... So they don't forsake it. Like, we, we, we probably will not have the house that we live in standing 200 years from now. But the mountains will still be there. Right? There's a permanence and an enduring quality to the things that God makes and the ways that he moves and the work that he does, including the work that he does through us. There's a hint there. But our stuff doesn't. Three, there's a suggestion that we ought to find beauty in the moment, in verse 11 of chapter 3, right? What does it say? He has made everything beautiful in its time. So we have this hint. Yes, the Ecclesiastes preacher somehow, in some small way, is hinting towards the idea that YOLO might actually be on to something, right? There's an enjoyment of the here and now. And four, verse 13 suggests that we can and should find pleasure in the, in, the, in the momentary parts of life. When life is joy, we should find joy in it because those things are a gift from God. Right? It even calls those things gifts of God to man. And so somehow God has something to do with the things that aren't hevel, that aren't meaningless. Somehow his stuff is what endures. And if we can find a way to get around or behind it, then we might find endurance and meaning too. And somehow we, we, we look for the beauty of the moment and we are called to just enjoy when God gives us beauty. You might have a whole day full of struggle, but there's just that, that two-minute chunk in there that you go, yeah, that was a good part. Right? Enjoy that. Hold on to it. Don't try to dissect it too much, right? And don't try to invest in the things that don't last too much. Over the next few weeks, the author is going to continue to unpack, the preacher, sorry, is going to continue to unpack the various things in our life that we put first that are really hevel. And he's going to kind of, he's essentially deconstructing the way that we look at the world in order to conclude by building up the way that we ought to, to see the one thing, the one way of looking at life that doesn't render it meaningless. And I promise you that by the end of week five, we will get there. There is meaning to be found in the word. But this is a difficult exploration. And so I want to encourage you that if, if you want to dig into this, if you want to have good discussion about this, if you want to have conversations about the meaning of life, that, that, you, that you take part in our study every week that meets because it's just going to be a good time to get together with people and to, to dissect this book. This isn't a, a book that just lends itself well to being lectured from a stage. This is a book to be consumed together as the people of God. Right? And my hope would be that next week Carlton comes to me like two minutes into the study and says, we got to leave classroom B because we got to go somewhere where there's more room to be able to gather together and talk. As a matter of fact, we might have to break into small groups and talk at tables because it's just it's a too, too much of a crowd. Right? Let's come together. Let's dig into this wisdom book because there's no more important question than what is our purpose and meaning here? What are the things that we should pursue? So often we look at scripture as this prohibitive thing of don't do this, don't do this. God gives the set of rules. No, the Lord has a way for us forward that brings meaning and flourishing. Let's discover together over the next few weeks what that way is and what it looks like. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God of meaning. Lord, we have tried to find purpose and satisfaction 
and all kinds of things in this world. And Lord, they're, they're not bad things. It's not bad to want a good career. It's not bad to, to save for your family and for retirement. It's not bad to plan things out. It's not bad to read and gain knowledge. Those are all good things. But Lord, we have a tendency to make them the ultimate thing. And one of the frustrations of life is that no matter what we pursue, it seems that we always come up feeling empty. Maybe not at the beginning, but eventually. That whatever we acquire or achieve, there's somehow a next step and something else to acquire or achieve on top of it. And Lord, we just we find ourselves unfulfilled and longing for something more. We praise you that in, in some way you are that something more. And we pray that you would help us over the next few weeks unpack what that means for us as your people. Guide us and shape us into the people you want us to be so that we might find meaning and purpose and so that we might in turn be able to portray and convey that meaning and purpose to the world around us as we love them and we show them your love. Be with us this week as we go out. We love you and we praise you. And together, all as people said, amen.